if you know your why, you'll find your way in life. Mm. If you don't know your why, everything else is in the way. But if you know your why, somehow those mountains don't appear to be as big as they were. Welcome to the Focus on the Family broadcast, helping families thrive. Ken, welcome to Focus on the Family. Thank you. It's great to be here, to be with you. Now you have that wonderful British accent, so you're residing in London. I don't think I've got the accent. <laughs> <laughs> okay, touche. Welcome. Welcome to America. We love America. <laughs> <laughs> and we're grateful for that. Let me ask you, I, I saw the title, Know Your Why, and my first thought is, what is my why? We're getting into the what, where, and why stuff, but what is my why? What do you mean by the word why? What I mean by the word why is that deep inner conviction that the Spirit of God puts upon the people of God that they matter to God in all aspects of life, not just in the church aspect. Hmm. And that's what I really mean. There is, a, there is the spirit that's working long before people try and say, well, how will I serve God? Where will I serve God? When will I serve God? How long, O oh Lord? But unless you tackle the why question, that there is a purpose to your life, those others become much more difficult to answer. Why do you think we, we separate those uh, attributes, um, our vocation, our spiritual walk, our family? Why do we struggle integrating those well, under a faith umbrella? Well, that's such a good question. I tell you why I think it is. I think that the world that we're living in is a very siloed world, very mm. atomized. It's trying to divide us into different parts. This is your family life. This is your work life. This is your spiritual life. This is your school life. This is where, and nothing holds together. But Paul writes to, to the Colossians, he says, in Christ Jesus, all things hold together. And mm. that's the great thing we have, is to be able to pull them together in Christ Jesus. For that person that's going to church, but uh, waking up on Monday, maybe in the business world, you sure. spent 40 years in banking. Sure. You can live a bifurcated life. Totally. How does a person take the assessment to say, okay, something is not right. I'm not integrating my faith. What does that look like? Well, what it looks like is you have to have one thing in mind when you go to work, that my workstation is my worship station. Hmm. If your workstation and your worship station run together, you're going to live an integrated life. If you've split the two up, you'll just screw yourself up hmm. mentally, physically, emotionally. You'll try and be you know, hard at work, competitive from Monday to Friday, and then the kind dad, uh, father to the kids, good husband, well relaxed at the weekend. It doesn't work. So for you in the banking business, Ken, were there moments where you acted out of character, the stress of competing for that big contract? Sure, sure. How did you manage that as a Christian man? Well, we fail <laughs> from time to time. We don't get it right. Um, the, the Christian life isn't the calling to be perfect. But I know this. People often say to me, well, does it make you a better banker because you're a Christian? Answer is no, but it makes me a better Ken as a banker. It's mm -hmm. better able to cope with the hardship, the, the harsh commercial compromises of the world in which we're living. Mm -hmm. We're not living in some neutral place. We're living in a place which is tough. I don't have to tell any of your listeners about stress, and they don't have mm -hmm. to tell me because I know about it, and they know about it, and you know about it. And stress is a 24-7 phenomenon, and we need to learn to be able to cope with that. And I believe that the power of the Spirit of God enables us to be able to deal with this continuing stress that we're living in and to find a way in which we can live well hmm. in the modern world. So how did you find your why, and wh how is it defined? Well, it changes over a period of time. Hmm. You know, you, you need to find your calling. Some of us work for cash, nothing wrong with that. I've worked for cash. Some work for a career, nothing wrong with that. I've done that. Some work for a great cause, a, a great voluntary organization, or not-for-profit as this one is. But if you don't work for a calling, if you don't know your calling, you will burn out. So it's very important to get to a stage where you have that deep inner sense that Jesus Christ has called me specifically into a task that he has given me to do. And for me, to come to the question, it was to be a good banker and a good husband and father, I hope, as well, but also to have a twin track of working in the voluntary world as well for the church and 
in, in small connect groups and writing books uh, and preaching and mm. teaching. But above everything else, it is that in Christ Jesus, all things hold together. Mm. Ken, let me ask you, the, um, the reason we kind of shortchange ourselves when it comes to vocation, oftentimes when I'm meeting with the folks who support this ministry, um, sometimes they'll feel, um, I don't know, maybe that they're not as significant because they're not working directly in ministry, but they're doing banking, they're doing oil and gas, they're doing real estate, they're doing these vocational things that for them in their own self-perception isn't as credible. That's not the way to look at this, is it? No, it's not. And the sad thing is, that of course, what happens is that the pastors in the church, for no reason that I could blame them, because they're not trained that way, will think of the business community as a good milk cow, get some money out of them to keep the whole show running. The best pastors say, look, how can we invest in you to recognize that there is one indivisible Lord, the Lord of the money markets, is the Lord of mercy, the Lord of profit, is the Lord of prayer, the Lord of competition, is the Lord of compassion. There mm. is one indivisible God. We can't divide him up and say, oh, well, let you go off to do filthy stuff at work and we'll do clean stuff in the church. Not at all. We all work together mm. and we need to help each other to find our callings in life. I remember making a thank you call for a gift here, Focus, and uh, the donor couple on the other end, the husband said, you know, um, my wife and I appreciate the fact that you run Focus effectively and efficiently for us to do ministry through you. Uh, and at uh, first I yeah. went, uh, what? Yeah. <laughs> but he's absolutely right. Absolutely. My goal yeah. is to run Focus as effectively Brilliant. and efficiently as possible so, good. so that people can support the ministry and do ministry through us. Yeah, and a great steward. I love that resources. concept. That's mm-hmm. very That good. puts, that yeah. knits it all together. It does. Uh, that the person out doing the vocational thing, earning a living, yeah. and then supporting their church, supporting ministries like Focus. And it honors that person it as does. well. You know, it honors the giver. Mm. Uh, it doesn't sort of deal it as, you know, you, you're a second class citizen. You know, I've given my money to a good person, a good organization to steward it well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. All right, John. So you and I, you, you've got a couple of kids older than my 16 and, and 14 year olds. Like five older kids. <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> but young people in their 20s, I mean, they're really, you're seeing this in your own family. They're struggling yeah. to get traction. And to say, okay, Lord, what is it you want me to do? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and well, I, I think Ken, it comes down to what do you, what do you advise somebody in their twenties that wants to? I mean, they're passionate sure. about following God. Sure. Uh, calling and career feel sure. kind of separate to them. Sure. Uh, how do they? This this is really a stress point for well, a couple I, of my kids, and 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 for generations throughout the world. And I've been traveling all throughout the world. It is exactly the same. And here's the issue. Never before have we had uh, an aging population that is going to grow much older. While young people have got so much choice that they're totally overwhelmed by the choices. Mm-hmm. We live in a multi-choice world. Mm. And whereas I you know, can look back on my career where I had my two or maybe three jobs, there is nobody in that millennial group that will not have six, 10, 12 different jobs. One job will start as an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur, and you'll pivot into something else. Mm -hmm. How is it that you can then, and this is what we need to help people to do, to focus on your calling now, to be fully committed to what you're doing now, believing that that's where the Lord has got you to be, whilst at the same time keeping an openness to the Spirit leading you to the next. Mm -hmm. Now, the difficulty for the generation is there's a constant expectation of FOMO, the fear of missing out. I'm going to miss out unless I grab the next opportunity and rob yourself of enjoying what God has given you to enjoy and to work at in your calling, in your groove right now. What are those practical steps as you're looking for your calling? How do you map something out to say step one, step two? Is it, is it that uh, well, analytical? It, it is in part analytical because it's very biblical. And uh, the Bible is full of very good advice, uh, all of which is recorded in the wonderful book. But let me give you a quick summary of it. First thing to do is to consider well 
Just consider what the opportunity is. Second, consult with other people who are around you, got skin in your game, who who are actually mm. going for you. Third, clarify the issue. Tweet it to yourself. 140 characters. I'm facing a job change. 140 characters. What is the real question? Because so often we forget what the question is and muddle ourselves up. Sure. And fourth, you need courage. The courage to make a decision once you've clarified it. Mm. And in my experience, particularly for younger people, they've clarified it, just haven't got the courage to take on to the next step. And there's great biblical precedent, can't go into them all, uh, for for us being able to be courageous. Mm. Fear not, says Jesus, you know, I've overcome the world. It's this constant tension between preparation, planning, and trusting. And I think that's something that, that is... Um, we hold that in, in a certain tension, don't we? Well, we hold it in a tension, but it's not an unresolved tension. In other words, if you keep holding things like that in tension, you're going to do your head in because <laughs> right. you just can't cope with it. It's holding them together on the basis that not everything is disclosed to us immediately. Mm-hmm. There are waiting periods. You know, Jesus is not going to give you the answer. God isn't Google. You can't get my why by Googling it because there is a time of seeping, of preparation, of, of, of actually preparing beforehand. And then those, those, those tensions, once given to God, you know, surrendered to him, actually become things that we can live with yeah. rather than, than stuff that just eats us up. I can't mm-hmm. resolve it now and you know, just, you know, just eats at you. What about that situation where you're ping-ponging? Uh, and I'm thinking of someone I know who has vacillated between finishing seminary, bouncing back into business, and it, to me as an observer, it's, it's more the waning of passion in between these hmm. two destinations. So he'll do business for two or three years and then feel unfulfilled and then want to jump back into direct ministry, become a pastor, become a missionary, then that wanes and then they want to yeah. jump. And I think a lot of young people are in that yeah, spot where they're they're kind of vibrating between directions. Yeah. What do you do for that? Well, what you do is you've got to take control of your destiny. It is true that uh, Jesus Christ is our leader and shows us the way but he also expects us to take control of our hearts our minds our imaginations and not just to be knocked from one side to another so there is a responsibility that rests in taking control of you know your your direction rather than being pushed about by whatever the sort of current mood or the current yeah. feelings might be in a in a particular workplace or in a church and then just drift, and if it doesn't work out, oh, I'll go traveling. I can remember even mm. before coming to focus on the family, um, uh, I was working in business. I studied my last year at Waseda University in Japan. I was uh, totally geared toward doing international business, and I felt pretty confident the Lord was calling me sure. into that. And I had an interest in it. I had a desire. And then over a short period of time, probably four or five years, I was probably 28, um, I got a phone call with Focus, and they asked if I'd be interested in coming to work here. And I can remember talking to this person, and they were in the business world but had retired and moved into ministry. And I remember him coaching me to say, we need good Christian representation in the business world. I would cautiously consider that move, but I would encourage you to stay in the business world. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, I made a different decision. But that kind of sound wisdom was uh, helpful to me to even sort out the final decision that I made. How critical is that kind of input from a friend or a mentor? Oh, I think and then vital. secondly, does God care where I end up or that I'm serving him where I end? <laughs> hmm. I think God is much more interested in the way in which we approach him than where we end up. If faith were knowledge, it wouldn't be faith. The element of trust is the element of uncertainty. I don't know how the cards are going to fall. I don't know what's going to be there next. I have to trust him that the decision that I make is the best decision I could have made in the circumstances uh, that were at the time, Mm -hmm. provided I have been studying the Bible, 
I've, re- I've prayed with others. I've prayed by myself. I've written down the issues that are faced one way or the other. I've used my mind, my heart, my imagination. You know, so often people say, well, I'm waiting for God to show me the way. Well, in my experience, he doesn't act like that. If he did, why would he have given us hearts and minds and imaginations and strengths and weaknesses and experience? I like this idea of being prepared no matter what, where God plants you. Get up every day thinking, Lord, here I am. What can I do? And then you apply yourself in that regard, a, whether you're a baker, sure. a, a sure. missionary. Sure. You just go to work every day working on his behalf. That is absolutely true. And I'd add one little thing to it. There are three three, uh, three things that I think makes a huge difference, and that's this, is that in that process, you need to know that you're loved by God, that you're known by God, and that you're called by God. Mm-hmm. If you hold those three things together, being loved, being known, mm-hmm. and being called, it makes a huge difference. It sets you free mm-hmm. to enjoy the day as it unfolds. And, and Ken, I so appreciate what you're saying right there. Uh, I'll reference my kids and their friends. There is some fear about even that they know God loves them. Yes. And they know that, that um, he's for them, but yes. they have this fear that they're going to miss the call. And I didn't grow up with that call thing. What What is that, and how is it different than a career or... Uh, how does that relate to the why of the book? Well, so the, the, the first bit is to remember the words of Jesus. You haven't chosen me. I have chosen you. And I've chosen you with a particular purpose. John 15, when he says, I've invested in you. I've made an investment in you mm-hmm. so that you might go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. So that anxiety of missing suggests that I've got to be the one to make a whole make my choice and if I don't make that choice I'm gonna get it wrong. Mm-hmm. But it's the other way around. God has himself in Christ called us. He has said, I will show you the way. What we need to do is to follow. Uh if we follow him, we will face him in the way in which those first two disciples faced him in the early parts of John's gospel. When Jesus turns to them and says to them, What do you want? What do you want? And John 1. And he knew that they were following. The moment he saw they were following, he could ask the question, what do you want? And that's the question Mm. I would say to your children and to mine and to anyone listening. Mm. He's listening. What do you want? If If we submit to him, we begin to know our why. And and here is is the piece that I found so helpful. If you know your why, you'll find your way in life. If you don't know your why, everything else is in the way. You you you, you stumble over everything. The mountains are too big. The finances are too too strong. I don't have the background, the education, the training. I could never reach this goal. It, it's it's not for me. It overwhelms you. But if you know your why, somehow those mountains don't appear to be as big as they were. That is so good. Uh, you know, one of the things, too, as a young person particularly, and again, we're trying to speak on your behalf, the 20, 30-somethings. <laughs> Although these are really great principles that apply to Absolutely. Pretty much yeah. But hopefully no, no. after you move through your 30s, you kind of have some of this figured out, yeah. I hope, but not, not necessarily. No, because life changes. Correct. You know, there are different – we have to recognize that there are stages in life. There are seasons in life. Mm particularly in the modern world. There are seasons in which we will be working for ourselves, working for someone else, working in a voluntary organization, looking for second and other careers. used to be something one thought of as a second career. Well, now it's the sixth or seventh. Yeah. But there are seasons, and we need to discern the seasons mm. and be strong and happy in those seasons. So in that regard, for that, again, 20, 30-something who um, is trying to discern, is this a, a point along a continuum that I've got to find with God? This is exactly what he wants me to do, versus uh, maybe the fear that I'll miss it, uh, sure. you know, that somehow I'm not going to find the point <laughs> at which he wants me to sure. engage. Sure. H- how do you address those kind of fears if, if and faith, apprehensions? If faith were knowledge, it wouldn't be faith. <laughs> you have to live with risk, and the risk is faith. It's the trust that if I'm, if I'm learning and hearing, then I'm going to be able to follow him. And here's the issue. How do you hear God's voice 
in a noisy world. Mm. And we are very noisy. Um, our smartphones tell us where we are, what music we listen to, what type of people we are. It's on all the time. And it's noisy. If you want to hear God's voice in a noisy world, you have to take a step to cut some of that noise out and to hear him. You can't just think that he's going to intervene in your world so to be redirect. Intentional, intentional uh, making space, turning it off for a moment. Um, if How I'm, do you do it? What do you do to give yourself space? Well, I try uh, first thing in the morning is to take take time to I think time to pray or to meditate, to reflect, to read, mm. to take some time out, um, and to build in those moments mm -hmm. when you can reflect. And of course, Sunday is very important to yeah. take it off. Ken, I appreciate that. And just thinking through the years, um, you know, as you've captured it in the book, Know Your Why, uh, earlier here when Jim was talking, I was thinking of the prophet Jonah. So have you had a moment when you did hear God, but like Jonah, you didn't like what he was saying? <laughs> yes. Yes. I mean, I, I, I thought of several times in the midst, I mean, you know, the, the, the business world, investment banking, uh, whatever, you know, you know, software programmer, wherever you are, hard-pressed teacher, you know, you're working there every day, and not every day is meaningful. And you sort of say to God, you know, I don't want to be here anymore. I look at my pastor friends. So I must have missed the call if that's must the case, have right? the call, you know, well, you know, because this is hard work. But you've got to treat it as a season. If you take your temperature every day, Monday is always awful. <laughs> um, but you've got to be able to see God's work in seasons. And you can't constantly say, oh, I, want to, I just want to get out of this. So uh, did he call you to something you didn't want to do or you were re reluctant? Well, I, there were moments of reluctance to being an investment banker. They were hardly mm. flavor of the month. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but, you know, you, I realized that there was, he wanted me to be there, mm. you know, to stay in the city uh, and to to work uh, work in the in within the hardship of the city, um, w rather than drawing me out of it into being in a f in a in a paid full time ministry. I think these are all full time ministries. Ken, let me ask you mm. this: um, We tend to equate in our human experience God's blessing, meaning I'm taken care of, I'm comfortable. Uh, and therefore, I'm in God's will yeah. because he's yeah. meeting every need and every want that yeah. I should have. I think we're particularly susceptible to this in the Western world, certainly here in America. I don't want to speak on behalf of England. But in America, we're very me-centric. Mm -hmm. uh, and so often we have that equation in our mind. Uh, speak to the issue where God is totally in your corner. You're in the right spot. But your circumstances may not be affirming you in the way that you think they should. Mm. That's such an important, uh, such an important issue. Let me let me try and tackle it this way. You will only know your why in and through others. Mm. If you are the if you are the sole arbiter of your why, of your purpose, of your calling, you will never know the fulfilment that the New Testament promises to us. It is in and through others. Paul says, for me to live is Christ. For me to live is someone else. And however your circumstances are, you could have the most menial or the most um, worthwhile uh, employment. Whatever it is, uh, you need to be able to look at what you're doing in and through the way in which you're experiencing it through others, through voluntary work, through the work that you're doing uh, with your with your money, with your resources, with your time, with your energy, so that it's not just that the world moves about wherever I happen to be, but it is in a community, and mm. that's why the church is such an important, powerful uh, uh, tool for God's reaching the world around us. And you'll know your why in and through your interactions uh, with other people. Man, this has flown by, John. Hasn't it? It's been I mean, really, it's crazy. Really good. This has been uh, such a good discussion, Ken. Oh, well. um, people need to get your book I and uh, know, know your why. I mean, for me, especially a dad of two teenagers, yeah, yeah, you can't start early enough talking yeah. about these things. Uh, everything we discussed today, not to let your circumstances dictate your joy in Christ, yeah. 
to to be prepared and to seek the Lord every day to say, what can I do today, Lord, for you? And to be content. The difficulty is that if you've got your your smartphone, it is the source of revelation. Mm -hmm. It will reveal everything to you. Including your weight. Including your weight. <laughs> do you stand up? Do you phone? Do you stand up? <laughs> well, well, I've got I to do, to... do 10,000 steps today. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, right? See? It, it tells you everything. It tells me my why. Um, and if, if it, it, a generation that, that will constantly seek this source will always be unsatisfied mm. because you can never get to a full state of contentment. What I did mean to add is after the four C's, how do you know that you're in the center of, the, of, of God's walk for you? Is the contentment. Contentment, yeah. yes. The peace that passes all understanding will come upon you. Can just simply terrific to have you on board. Well, thank you very much for both of you. And if I might just end this by saying, if you know your why, help others to find theirs. Mm. And if you don't know your why, the Spirit of the Lord Jesus is there to help you, to guide you. Mm. But remember that you're loved, you're known, and you're called by Him. Mm. Hey, I'm John Fuller, and thanks for watching. Get more info about Focus over here and more from our guests over there, and be sure to subscribe to our channel as well.